Please help me welcome to the stage Vivian Naidu, the Director of Infrastructure Africa at Tinner and Townsend, to discuss the topic, Striving for Net Zero, the Impact of Not Making It a Priority. Joining Vivian this morning on this panel is Thomas Fula, Senior Development Manager at Attack, Dylan Governor, Associate Director and Whole Life Cycle Coasting Lead at Turner and Townsend, Amy Girdwood, Co-Founder at Stories Evolved, Zanele Mavusombata, CEO of Bambili Energy, Chilufia Lombe, Founder and Partner at Solid Green Consulting CC. Now, you remember what I said yesterday, we are so grateful that these people will even come to participate. What you see today is a 45, 60 minutes panel, but they've put so much months into research, into giving you quality information on the stage. So when I welcome them, I need a level three applause. That is your loudest, your boldest. Let us appreciate them and show them some love. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Vivian and his panel. Come on, guys, you can do way, way better than that. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, hopefully, everyone had a good evening uh, and good day one. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this morning's discussion. Everyone's fresh, had a cup of coffee, which is great. Uh, I th suppose just to kick off quickly in terms of the panel today, uh, so my esteemed guests, uh, quick introductions. Um, I'll start with my right, Amy Girdwood. She's the co-founder of a company called Stories Evolved. Now, Amy is an experienced sustainability and corporate responsibility professional educator and corporate lawyer with a master's degree in sustainability leadership from the University of Cambridge. She spent six years in practice in South Africa and the United Kingdom with a focus on energy and procurement law before starting a professional life as an independent consultant and entrepreneur. Some of our focus areas relating to ESG opportunities, uh, challenges, laws, policies, programs, and governance processes. Next to Amy is Zanele Mavusu Mombata, the CEO of uh, Bambili Energy. Zanele has 27 years experience in the renewable energy industry, mining industry, and financial markets. Zanele is also the co-lead in the development of the fuel cell industry uh, she's currently involved in the first hydrogen corridor in South Africa with the South African and international co cooperations for the rollout of hydrogen fuel cells and trucks and buses. Importantly, she's been involved in some of the hydrogen economic hubs and uh, fuel cell training opportunities, training up to 35 engineers. In fact, some of Zanella's uh, work has been involved in uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic uh, in terms of providing some of the backup power for some of the facilities. Next to Zanele is Dylan Governor. Uh, he's a professional QS with experience in commercial developments, public education facilities, residential, industrial projects. Um, he heads up the whole life costing service at Turner and Townsend Advisory Services uh, with an area of speciali specialization in running and developing total cost of ownership models, uh, focusing on renewable industries, renewables in the industry. Next to Dylan is Thomas Fuller. Uh, Thomas is a quantity surveyor, um, well, started as a quantity surveyor. He's now with a TAC property fund as a senior development manager, focusing on the Waterfall City. 
His interest lies in greenfields development with a strong concentration on green buildings, sustainable development, and investment fundamentals, portfolio resilience, whole life uh, analysis, net zero buildings performance, and reduced embodied carbon construction. And I think we'll talk a lot about that uh, in today's discussion. Last but not least is uh, Chilu, just off the highway at the moment, just ran in. Uh, Chilu is a mechanical engineer, uh, is also a director and founder and partner at Solid Green Consulting. So he's got extensive experience in both performance and accreditation modeling for sustainability projects and performed energy modeling for the first Green Star rated office in South Africa. So I think with that, we've got, we've got a uh, panel uh, who's, who's going to give us practical advice. And I think um, key takeaways that we want is what are the issues of today and how do we move forward? Uh, as much as the topic is about reset, we need to understand that we are still uh, grappling with some of the post-pandemic issues. We've got issues around low occupancy. There's pressure around um, rentals, uh, costs, future of work is having an impact for all of us in this, in this industry. Um, and amongst all of those competing for, for attention, is there still headroom for net zero? Uh, what, what does it mean in the current environment, current context? So today, we should try and get a view, what are the practicalities of it? Let's acknowledge what are the issues, and is there a way forward? How do we actually take it forward? What's, what's the opportunity there for us? Um, and I think that's what our panelists are gonna tell us today. So, uh, Thomas, if I could start with you, you're, you're in the industry, constantly having to deal with, um, with, uh, with developers, with tenants, occupiers. Um, what are some of the issues around the understanding of net zero? What, what does it mean for our, our industry? And what's the burning case for change? And, and, and why is that not coming through in our industry? I suppose one of the biggest things is the definition of net zero and understanding exactly what it is and what you are trying to achieve. First of all, let's maybe say what net zero is in the context of our discussion today is around using a certain amount of electricity and theoretically using and developing and, 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 and uh, putting a system in place of using renewable energy to offset that. And I think one of the things when you start looking at these sort of proposals moving forward is that everybody goes, oh, wow, I need something more. It's going to cost me more. There's a resistance to spending in the current market. There is headline earnings. There's uh, dividends per share. There's a whole lot of other kind of resistances from an investment perspective that are building a resistance against these sort of philosophies. However, legislation and all of these sort of uh, new systems and processes, you go King 4, you go ESG strategies, you go uh, um, all of these sort of uh, new uh, declarations that we need to put out in the market are actually driving us towards having to achieve net zero strategies. Us as a TAC property fund, and we're not the only one, uh, many of the, the listed property funds have had to put out absolute targets currently. Um, that is our carbon footprint defined. Uh, based on S, uh, SBTI um, target analysis. We are now putting out to the public domain that we need to reduce our carbon footprint by more than 54% by 2030. But when you look at it really from the situation, 2030 is eight years away, but in South Africa and in Africa as a holistic continent, we are not facing an electrical uh, carbon footprint crisis in 2030. We're actually facing an electrical and supply crisis in 2022. And this is why it's becoming quite interesting. Obviously, you are all aware, and I don't think this could have come at a better time necessarily from a, a, a panel discussion, is that we're in stage six load shedding now. And the effect that stage six load shedding is actually having on the cost of occupation and the ability to recoup costs from tenants. And it, it, in our world, it's really about an investment. And our investment is the asset that we develop. The asset is then uh, basically let to tenants and tenants occupy that space so that their workers can produce more money. And if the cost of occupation becomes prohibitive, that of, of rental to turnover numbers becomes prohibitive to continuing, ladies and gentlemen, we no longer have an investment. And we no longer have something that actually has asset value that people want to invest in. So net zero is not actually something that you can say is a nice to have. Net zero is a strategy we need to roll out now. 
in order to try and achieve the objectives, in order to make sure that our assets that we are developing, in, and we're not talking about a couple of hundred thousand rand or dollars or kwacha or whatever you want to talk about, we're talking about millions and millions of kwacha and dollars, things that are listed, those investments are secured as an investment portfolio for people to invest in and people to be able to occupy in order to try and generate income. Thanks, Thomas. So it's about the financial impacts. It's, it's about bottom line. So then, Amy, why are boards, executive C-suites uh, not imbibing this into their ESG response? Um, is it part of it, or is it just not featuring as part of that ESG response for companies? Um, Vivian, so I, I think there's a lot happening. I mean, if you look in the media or read the paper, you see um, loads of commitments that are being made uh, in terms of net zero. Um, and strategies that are being put out in terms of ESG with net zero being a part of that. I think um, the issue is that there is a really big gap between those voluntary commitments and what is actually happening in practice, and those voluntary commitments and the speed and scale of the change that science says we need to drive in order to reach net zero and the required temperature range. I think that's for a number of reasons. I think it's, it's hard. It's hard to do things differently. It's hard to think about things differently. For so long, managing an organization, um, being a director, being a trustee, your fiduciary responsibilities have focused on returns and what's happened with the changing climate um, is that those returns are being materially impacted by considerations that are not necessarily just in the short term. And I mean, so we haven't yet mentioned climate change, but all the science says that there are dramatic risks to the real estate sector in particular globally um, given its reliance on not just energy, but also our natural resources for the construction of the various materials used in the building um, because of its reliance on the tr transportation sector. So the real estate sector is heavily reliant on a lot of hard to decarbonize sectors. And these are all the issues that directors and fiduciaries, um, directors and trustees are grappling with. And I think one of the biggest issues is that they know there's a lot of noise around net zero. There's a lot of noise around ESG. They need to be doing something. They are told that it will give them access to financial capital. And certainly banks are, um, are increasing their commitments and investment houses are increasing their commitments in relation to net zero positive or ESG positive related opportunities. Um, disclosure requirements are increasing. And um, so that's putting pressure on banks and um, big pension funds, for example, to be far more transparent about where their money is going and, um, and what, you know, what impact it has in terms of net zero specifically. So because of that, I think that there's a lot of action, but there's not necessarily, um, just referring back to what Thomas was saying about an understanding of what net zero is. Net zero is far more than something that you got to tick yes on to ensure energy security to make you um, more attractive to an investor or to a financier. Um, and I think that the problem is that a lot of people don't understand how net zero relates to a lot of systemic risks that underpin the real estate sector being resilient and successful in the long term. I'll stop there for the moment. Uh, thanks, Amy. So, so we're hearing a few things. It's important from a profit perspective. It's a prom important from a triple bottom line perspective for your people, for the larger game, compliance, legislation, the fiduciary duties of, a, of executive. But Dylan, when, you, when it's down to how do we make a business case, you're having to deal with executives who are needing to look at costs and return. And um, when you go into those discussions, when it, when it comes down to uh, exactly that cost and return, 
what are some of the issues you are finding or seeing with either occupiers or developers who are needing to make a decision? What, what, are, the, what are the data deficiencies or what's the lack of understanding around cost that's either causing them to not make a decision or, or the decision, decision is just becoming too hard to make? Thanks, uh, Bev. So it's an often misconstrued uh, question in terms of my goals towards net zero. So in the South African context, um, you get various levels of um, compliance towards net zero. Um, and obviously, there's the cost impact on achieving each of those levels. So in the corporate uh, commercial real estate environment, we currently look at level one and level two in terms of um, decarbonization and obtaining a net zero carbon rating. Um, and, and what we observed in terms of uh, the market at the moment is that our uh, real estate clients, um, REITs, and to a large extent some of the public sector clients, especially in the triple P front, uh, have the maturity and understanding of their um, sustainability goals and improving uh, the performance of their buildings and efficiencies. So they have been stepping stones in terms of um, sustainability initiatives, which the Green Building Council had been driving, where clients were reaching um, green building ratings, four star, five star, six star, lead ratings, uh, edge ratings, which uh, some of the panelists discussed yesterday. And a lot of those initiatives are sort of stepping stone or, or guidelines in terms of reaching to the ultimate utopia in that, in terms of net zero. Net zero obviously has the end point of uh, having an efficient building and be able to offset your carbon either through uh, on-site power generation or, or off-site or carbon credits. So the question here is, uh, how do you really put a cost to this? And I think as Thomas had indicated earlier, we have an energy crisis at the moment, not just in South Africa, Africa as a continent as a whole. So a lot of our clients have already embraced the PV technology and and as you know, net zero is, and renewable energy are fundam fundamental to each other. And through the implementation of the PV systems currently in a lot of the buildings, um, a lot of our clients have sort of walked their journey already. So if you start off with a clean baseball project with efficient design and with PV implementation, obviously each site and each project is different for various site constraints. I think we often uh, come at loggerheads with engineers um, and architects in terms of who gets the share of the roof space. Um, but uh, should you have implemented those strategies at a, at, a, at a design point of view, the current cost of level one compliance from a baseball perspective um, is mitigated by having security from an energy point of view so it's, uh, so it's positive that the industry is, have, have already walked down this journey and it's, it's an education point of understanding that uh, the steps and the return on investment, especially looking at the cost of uh, PV and renewable technologies at the moment, um, is conducive towards making it slightly better and easier to get to uh, the level one accreditation. In addition to that, government, um, is obviously on the journey towards net zero. Uh, as part of our NDP vision 2030, um, I think the proposed legislation that all buildings uh, I have to strive towards the net zero accreditation. So I think as also Thomas has alluded to, it's no longer nice to have, but it's something that we have to do now in order to secure our future um, in terms of the net zero space. Government also re recognizes that there's a lot of prohibitive costs in terms of transforming your business towards net zero. So there's various tax incentives, SARS 12L, uh, and other grants from the DTIC, which, which Daniela might mention later on in, on the panel. So there are ways and means in terms of uh, understanding and, and to combat the costs associated with net zero. Um, and I think Thomas, again, from a tech point of view, will also mentioned in terms of uh, the carbon tax currently uh, legislated in South Africa. It's a bit of an unknown in the future, but there are incentives that are currently being in place as well as um, grants and funding that make the transition less of a burden in terms of the uh, sector. 
Thanks, Elon. So, so it's an important point, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty around um, what sort of rebates, what, what, what the uh, incentives are going to be. And then Chilo, at the same time, there's professional teams being put together, trying to advise these, uh, trying to advise on development. So whether it's greenfields or whether these retrofits, um, we have a host of professionals that need to come together, have a consistent view around it to advise that client that actually this is the cost, this is how you can fund it, but actually here's how we can optimize design styles and on, on the operational side. But when I was reading up Ch uh, Chilo, um, so we spoke about the Green Star rating, but I saw at least five different types of green buildings from net zero ready, net zero energy, net zero carbon, uh, zero carbon and grid interactive. So our consultants helping our industry, I mean, how, how we, uh, can you just demystify a green building? And then how, how are consultants either helping or impeding some of the process around this decision making, cost, trade-offs, and actually how we get to better designs and operated buildings? Okay, cool. By, by consultants, I'm assuming you mean everybody else, not the green building consultants. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, yeah, I think the, the issue of definitions is a, is a real problem in sustainability. So definitions and to a certain extent certification, because once you start down the route where you are pursuing certification, a lot of times people forget that there's a real world performance that you, that, 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 that you need. South Africa has got a very mature green building industry, right? There's, I don't know what the current count is. It must be like 500 buildings or so. Um, the vast majority of those are four-star green buildings, right? So that means that for the last 10 years, we were doing just enough to say we're on this journey, but not really that much more. And because of that, the, some of the key principles that, that are required for us to continue to grow as an industry haven't really been adopted. Now you bring net zero in, and net zero is the most stringent um, sustainability target you can have. Four or five years ago at the Green Building Conference, just when we were really starting to talk about net zero, you know, I gave a talk and I said that we have to, in order to make this feasible, buildings have to use three to four times less energy than they're using now. Um, and now fast forward to 2023, that's the reality, but not much has changed in the way that we, ap we approach things. So I think the, the first part is just understanding the, the definition of what you're trying to achieve and what it's really about. When you talk net zero, anything with net zero, people immediately think about renewable energy. And in reality, what you should think about is energy efficiency because before you overlay anything, that building needs to quantifiably be the most energy efficient you've ever worked on. And my, my personal favorite phrase I always tell people is that if we are doing a net zero building and nothing uncomfortable has happened, then we're not actually doing it correct because it's a complete change to what we, we, we would normally do. So even the issue of cost, the issue net zero buildings should cost you less. And the problem is that they will cost more within the current design philosophies that we have. So now you get into a building and you say, how do I achieve net zero? And you say, in our climate, we are in one of the best climates for passive design. We should not need so much energy for heating, cooling, lighting. And to achieve net zero, it's either we are going to go to the most expensive glass known to man, or you can reduce the glass by half. Reducing the glass by half puts the correct performance in, it saves cost, but it hasn't gotten to the point where those are seen as commercially viable options for tenants. Well, that's the, that's the assumption. But now, most tenants and people occupying buildings, this has become such a big driver for them that if you could sell them a building that could guarantee that, that you're net zero carbon for your own scope two emissions, but it didn't look like all the other buildings they've occupied, they would definitely take it. And that's where a lot of the discussion is now to say, if these buildings have to look so different, or can they look the same and be net zero? If they do, then you're, you're throwing cost at it. If we design for our climate, you can definitely achieve it, but designing for our climate means that because we've borrowed a lot of architecture from other parts of the world, maybe people don't recognize these as being iconic or, or whatever it is. So I think as consultants now, we have to be able to work to the detail that is needed and, and also change. You know, if we are expecting a building to use four times less energy, every single member of that design team has to be completely different, including the client. You know, so 
I think it's really going to now foster the type of collaboration that we've always wanted over the last 10 years and haven't been able to because our targets were not as clear as they should be. Thanks, Jilo. And uh, Sunel, I, I hear the word often, collaboration. And you're trying to transform that industry. You're, you're doing pioneering work uh, in stationary power, backup power, um, you know, talking to developers, talking to professional teams, um, and, and showing what's possible, not now, but also in the, in the long term. Uh, but it's still hard to, to help make that, that mental transition. Like you say, it's, it's a change. Uh, just w what are your what are views around OEM suppliers in the space and the power specifically, and, and what's preventing early adopters? What's preventing uh, looking at fuel cells as the as the option going forward? Um, so I think um, the common theme that's run across this panel is the issue of change um, and collaboration, and I think that. Um, change is extremely difficult. And when you are trying to embrace new types of technologies, um, it's not an easy thing. Um, and as Dylan was saying, there's the issue of how do you think about cost? Um, and, and Thomas talked about how you need to think about return when you're running um, a business out at the end of the day. So I think the, the, the challenge and the difficulty is that not everybody, uh, most people want to come on the train when they know that the train is going to have a successful ride. Um, and so our challenge has been finding those early adopters um, who are willing to um, embrace new technologies and think differently uh, and reimagine how we power buildings going forward. Um, and we, I think, uh, are very excited about the fact that in, within South Africa, we do have some players who we are already collaborating with. Um, and it's interesting, it's on two levels. It's, it's developers such as Attack, where we have a great collaboration as well as with Turner and Townsend, where we are looking to do lighthouse, a lighthouse project around uh, the installation of a sizable fuel cell system in one of their buildings. And then you have the other end where we have customers um, or clients that we're speaking to who are tenants. And they are, are very sophisticated um, uh, consumers of uh, renewables and understand the benefits of an energy mix that is green uh, and that can be, uh, become more sustainable by using fuel cells and so are then demanding that their developer uh, um, uh, adopt um, this energy mix in order for them to be able to move uh, towards their net zero targets. So I think it's, it's a combination of these early adopters who are really paving the way for the industry. And we, and we are very excited about what's to become, especially in the next year or two, as some of these lighthouse projects are brought into the, in, in, into the public domain. Uh, thanks, Sonila. And that's a great, uh, great punt for attack, Thomas. I think uh, well done being the, that first adopter. But, um, what discussions are you having with tenants, occupiers? What is ATTAC trying to do in its space and industry to actually try and breach this gap? So we spoke about, we, we spoke about imperfect standards, imperfect definitions, but we're not going to get it right, right? Oh, no, we're not going to get perfect information uh, in the short term. So we have to make do. Uh, how's ATTAC approaching that? Well, uh, I think I've got some good practical examples, and maybe to Chilo on my right hand side yeah we've had some spirited discussions around these net zeros and we've actually achieved net zero buildings within our precinct already um and we've now seen them in operation seen the benefits of these particular buildings how they operate what are the benefits for the tenant why do tenants want to be in this space so you look at the case and you look at the way that you value buildings you value buildings over a life cycle over a whole of life cycle you're now reducing the electrical consumption you're mitigating the risk of impacts of macroeconomic uh, effects on the building operations and all of a sudden your, your yield and your return actually starts to make a lot of sense. Um, uh, in the project uh, we're, we're basically we've got the net zero building. We've reduced for example electrical consumption that's a level one so basically the base built system is off the grid 100% powered by PV. We've reduced electrical consumption by from 18 uh, between 18 and 20 rand a square meter on a normal standard building down to 9 rand a square meter which the tenant actually benefits from. Um, and all of a sudden you're starting to see this. 
that you are now softening the effect of ESCOM in, uh, price increases by 50% on their cost of occupation. You're creating a competitive edge in the market that nobody else is actually providing. So really what you're doing is you're making strategic decisions that drive tenants towards your portfolio by actually looking at this thing in a slightly different way. We look at it at a yield, initial day one yield, it's that, those days are gone. It's, it's, it's over whole of life. It's over a 20 year life cycle period if you wanna look at the PV systems and the way that these things are operating. Then it also comes back to exactly what Chilo was referring to as well, is looking at the building, how the building is physically operating, and then spending 20% uh, of the money solving 80% of the inefficiencies that currently exist. Um, we have a 4,500 square meter building. We spent just on a million rand, so 250 rand a square meter, if, for those of you interested in numbers. We've been able to reduce electric consumption, including plug loads. In other words, theoretically looking at level two, from 140 down to 69 kilowatt hours per square meter. Now, the base case on that thing, the yield is 9.5 to 10% on that return, because I can still charge the tenants on utilities, but I've built the, 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 the um, negotiation and capability into my environment to be able to negotiate an extension on that lease because the tenant is now in a building that's actually producing less electricity. They can't go anywhere else. So I've created a strategic position for myself that they can't go anywhere. And then I speak to the ESG strategies where tenants, particularly blue chip tenants, are now saying, particularly the global blue chip tenants are now saying, you need to be in a building that is at this level. Guys, I've created a market that nobody else can compete with because I'm now putting these strategies into place. And really, it's not actually that difficult. It is about combinations, but it is driven from the client. And it's around design, it's embracing the design. I mean, the mechanical engineers say, oh goodness me, we don't want natural air or the, uh, coming into the building because I don't get my fees on the HVAC. It's actually not about that. It's all about basically building efficiencies back in the system. They should be rewarded for natural air coming into the building. That is part of the philosophy of how that building is operating. Buildings are becoming like live humans. They're like, like, like my wife, she complains. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and you've got to understand why, why is she complaining. I mean, sometimes she just complains because it's me. But you start looking at these things and why the buildings are operating the way they are, and you can actually modify the behaviors. BMS systems built into the buildings to understand exactly what is happening in those buildings and how tenants are occupying those spaces. Then you can start looking at retrofitting and finding the business case, and this is why we, we pay this guy next to me for the brains, for his looks and his brains, to make all the clever decisions around how we make these buildings even more efficient, because that is how you're going to drive tenant demand and investment in your portfolio. So what is a tactic? I don't think a tax is doing it. I think the, the industry is starting to move very quickly towards that. We just identifying this as, a, as an opportunity as a first mover in the market based on proven costs. And not only are we doing that and we're actually reducing the cost of consumption, but we're doing it for the right reason. It's for the environment at the end of the day. Thanks, Thomas. And um, the MC did say it's internationally uh, streamed so you better find a very green building to sleep tonight because you're not going home <laughs> um, so, so Amy I mean it's it's um, uh, attack is a great example I think it's uh, the exact the board understands what needs to be done but in our audience if we've got you know members of exec are still mulling over like you said the noise what's the next step what's the first step to be done with that leadership so we get the tone at the top we get the right messaging at senior leadership from an ESG and a net zero perspective well I think in respect of the real estate specifically it's to start by understanding what the changing climate and uh, both environmental and social means for your business so for the assets that you hold for the tenants that you rent to for the talent that you have working for you who have a very different attitude about these issues. Um, clearly, if you look at that net zero and, and given the, the impact of um, the real estate sector on emissions, um, net zero is a material issue. Aside from the, if you look at the business kind of case for it, I mean, we've spoken a lot about the operational side of things avoiding business interruption because you've got continuous power say because you're not relying on ESCOM. Um, paying much less for electricity over the longer term as it pays itself off. Attracting blue chip kind of tenants. And I know that I, I work with clients who are professional services firms 
And in order for them now to tender for work for companies, they are being required to say what they are doing in respect of ESG and net zero. And part of that is definitely looking at the buildings that they are tenanting um, and the impact, the environmental impact of those buildings. But I think it's also important to look um, from a governance perspective a bit more broadly at, at your kind of business model. And at the end of the day, a business is reliant on its legal license to operate and its social license to operate. Um, we've spoken about the legal license. It is developing. It's slightly ambiguous in cases. I think what's happened is that the law has actually fallen behind expectations in society um, in terms of business, investors, civil society, organizations. And I think that's actually generally how the law goes. It normally plays catch up. The risk of that for companies is if you are so focused on legal compliance that you actually lose sight of the fact that you are now operating in a way that is no longer acceptable to the society in which you operate. Um, for the clients that you want to um, tenant in your building, for the employees that you want to work for you. And, and so I think that is something that a board needs to look at very carefully. Um, McKinsey speaks about the fact that, you know, there's a lot of debate around ESG and what does it mean and is it relevant even if you look at the energy crisis in Europe and what's that, what that's meaning for people returning to gas, for example. Um, at the end of the day, ESG and net zero is about a business responsibly managing its externalities and taking account for them. And without that, ultimately, you will not have a social license to operate. And I, I'll stop there, but um, there's increasing risk of litigation against corporates, um, which I can talk about, which is really being used as a lever to drive change quite outside of kind of the regulatory space. Thanks, Amy. So, so I think it's a bit of a character of a stick uh, and a stick approach. And, and maybe the appeal to you guys is um, go back to your company, your value statement, for instance. Have a look at those value statements, uh, purpose, uh, values, and, uh, and translate it into your, your, your property uh, response. And, and are you actually living to those values? And that might give you a view as to are you doing the right thing? Um, so not just the legal compliance. Um, Dylan, you, you've done various exercises, uh, scenarios around, is it true that net zero is a more costly exercise? Just some of that learning, some of the lessons, and something that uh, the audience can take away on, uh, is it really more costly? Uh, thanks, Bob. So I think if you speak to any Kwani survey in the room, um, from a commercial uh, point of view, looking at feasibility, so we always look at something called net first year return. It's a bit of a dirty word that we use often in the industry, but in order to get approval on EXCO, you need to meet a minimum return. And, it's, and the fundamental there is that you look at CapEx. So I think as uh, Thomas had alluded to, there's more to an investment or doing a building than just net first year return. It's about looking at the whole life cycle cost of a particular asset where you look at not just construction, you also look at operation of the building, the income generated from the building, as well as the disposal of the building. So as part of um, our service offering is that we look at CapEx view in line with what it can save you from a, um, over its life cycle from an operational view. I think it's common consensus that the cost per kilowatt hour on PV um, is significantly less than what you would get on grid. And we know that ESCOM with the current um, potential 30% increase next year, more and more so mitigates or, or um, in the positive towards uh, implementation of PV as an example. Another way of using whole life cycle costing, especially in the net zero space, is looking at, at alternative green energies. And we sort of touched on the cost of getting to a level one, and Thomas sort of alluded to level two from an occupancy emissions level. 
but we are on this journey towards going to level three from an embodied carbon point of view and level four respectively. So uh, Turn and Townsend, we have a embodied carbon calculator which we are pioneering in the UK. Uh, one of the concerns obviously in the South African or African context is that there's no um, data from an embodied raw materials point of view. Uh, there's various platforms which you could use in terms of localizing the current uh, em embodied or raw material um, carbon output. But what we are able to do in terms of whole life cycle costing and whole life cycle carbon accounting is that you are able to look at what a capex cost of a project is and look at the real cost over its life cycle, look at the nominal value and understand what its NPV at, as of today's uh, rate. Um, in terms of dispelling the notion that um, you know, there's a cost of green, um, the, our regional managing director, Stephen McCartney, was once said, oh, no, uh, a green building costs more. It's not going to get the minimum return. And we have actually undertaken the exercise where we developed a full model in terms of what are the costs involved in building a sustainable building the returns on investment over its life cycle, looking at in, uh, internal rates of return and comparing that to a traditional uh, building that just meets the minimum SANS code uh, as of 2022. Um, so whole life cycle costing is a great tool in order to understand the full implication of a particular investment strategy and not just looking at CapEx or being CapEx orientated. Uh, thanks, Dylan. So, so Chilo, we need, we need more data, operating performance, design performance. Uh, there's a few architects waiting for you outside that door because you, you, uh, we're not favored around there, favorable about the designs. But uh, we need industry to collaborate if we want to get this right. I mean, the, the size of the prize is big enough that we actually need to collaborate. Um, what needs to happen to get the professional teams, get collaboration within industry, within the, within the consultants, uh, around this issue of standards? I think the, the, the biggest thing is that um, creating a true process-based design. You know, very often what happens is when we start on a project, right, maybe the client and architect have been talking about a scheme or a model. They've had it ready for two years. Then you start on the project. It's all done. You know, it's like we're, we're trying to deliver this building. But if you have a process-based um, design process, you will start with the target and everybody understanding what the target is because all your design response is relative to that target and that target will include cost. You know, like you can't go and say that you're going to have 100% fully glazed building, it's gonna be net zero and then it's also going to conform to your normal uh, cost norms, right? So all of those things, not just the sustainability ones, the business ones as well, at the beginning you have the target, you know what the climate is, then in that first set of iterations that come out of the, of the architect, you're actually working with them to understand that this solution will never fall into those targets. So we can't, we can't have it there. Very often when we start, we're just working with like optimizing the last little bit, but everything else before that could have been done. And, and the climate we have here means that there's certain key elements that, that can really be done early on and then it can solve everything. And one thing that's very important is that we have to clear all the misconceptions. And I think if I can just list the biggest ones, especially on net zero, is that there's always this perception that net zero is off-grid. Net zero and off-grid are not the same thing. The way that net zero impacts energy security is that you'll reduce demand, right? You'll reduce demand, and also you have buildings that have the ability to feed into the grid. If you cannot feed into the grid, you cannot do a net zero building. If you can't feed into the grid, you're gonna do an off-grid building. You know, and those type of things are really important to understand that you know, with net zero, it's something that's done over time. And that's a big challenge because a lot of what happens in buildings is done for your peak, right? When you design your electrical infrastructure, you design for the worst case day. And that's where I think the difference between the work we do and traditional consulting is that you look at, we have to look at the average. We will want to make the average condition better and you have to still allocate the peak. And I think it's great when we're looking at like the new technologies that are possibly coming in because it tells you where the problem lies. So if you're looking to hydrogen fuel cells, for example, and you know that the cost is directly related to how much you need. If you say this building, we're gonna do 
uh, according to SANS, it's ATVA per square meter. Now, maybe if you've got an electrical engineer who's a bit more aggressive, he'll do it at 70. But if you go and you've got a portfolio of 100 buildings and you say, over the last 10 years, no building has ever gone above 40 per square meter, right? Now, if you were going to do a feasibility study on hydrogen and you said, every single building starts out wanting to do 70, without really trying, in operation, they're gonna have 40, but we are going to design this building to 20. Then that's where you start to see that, that collaboration and the, the, the fact that through that process, leveraging data and knowledge of people, that you can actually make these technologies work. But there's a point at which, um, when there's the inefficiencies, that the, the really innovative technologies that will unlock this will, will never come in. Th thank you, Lucio. A few, few good points. I think don't try and force fit a solution on the problem and the predefined. Um, and the thing around creating, um, it being disruptive around the, around the solutioning and the optioneering. Um, and Zanella, to, to that point, um, what's, what's your message to, to, the, to the audience, the developers out there, um, around how to think differently, think more innovatively around the solutions? And, uh, and maybe for the broader stakeholder group, I know um, government, various parts of government are sort of enabling entrepreneurs. I think Department of Science and Innovation has been very progressive around hydrogen specifically that we're speaking about. You know, we could be at the start of a, it's a nascent industry, but we could be, you know, leading in it uh, if we make the right decisions. So, so what's your message around there to the developers, to the occupiers, to, to the various stakeholders in the space around looking at new technologies? Um, my, I think, central message would be that it's so important to be on a learning journey. So uh, being on a learning journey means it's understanding what that energy mix means for you and your business and how to continue to drive profitability. And yet at the same time, you know, I think it's that whole uh, notion of walking and chewing gum at the same time. So you need to run a profitable business, but you also need to have energy security and you have to have a green energy mix all in one. And so I think um, being open to uh, learning, especially around the lighthouse projects that we see coming on stream in South Africa uh, in the built environment for you to really figure out how um, you can benefit from that. Um, and that, you know, understanding that uh, a lot of these technologies, especially the more uh, nascent ones, um, whilst they might be high, uh, in cost, it's all about having an energy mix so that how do you mix them up to optimize them at best and how do you leverage government incentives that are in place to support you in that adoption. Um, so I think it's about, you know, uh, and, and, and some technologies allow you to scale up. So uh, having initial exposure and growing um, your use of the technology as you come to know the technology rather than standing on the on the side of the road and, and waiting for it to take full hold. So I would encourage you to be on the journey. Thanks. Thanks, Anela. Uh, so uh, MC has guided me that we are gonna soon run out of time. So we'll open up to questions from the audience. Um, I'm not sure whether there's a roving mic or how we wanna do this, um, but if you put up your hand, I think a mic will make its way to you. And maybe while you think about that, and, and to anyone on the panel, are you greenwashing? Is this all hype? Chilo. Yeah, I think um, that's probably the most exciting part of the industry. We're going into this phase where it's all about the real numbers, right? So there's a lot of stuff you do conceptually. There's a lot that you, you will, um, in the planning phase, you can talk about what you're doing. But the reality is, is that you're going into a portfolio and maybe it's all green buildings, right? And they think that the path to net zero is very easy. Now you start to look at the real numbers and the real numbers are off. They're not what you thought. So you have to solve that, that real, real numbers. So definitely one of the things with net zero is that the definition is very easy, right, at zero. It's not like Green Star where you've got like, you know, there's this matrix that you have to figure out. So the performance you need is very simple and the reporting is very simple. So 
if there was anything around sustainability that, that would not be uh, greenwashing, it would be this, because you, you have to put your real numbers up, and you have to put them up forever. You know, it's not like you, you get to say it once and then it, you, 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 you carry on. So I think that's, it's exciting, but it also puts a lot of risk because if, if, if it's not working out, you know, it, it becomes a big problem. Yeah, please. Um, I, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, I think the, the risk of, um, in terms of greenwashing, is there's such an incentive to talk up what you're doing and talk up your commitments because it will make you so much more attractive to clients, to investors. Um, and, and one of the issues we face is that many companies have made um, many commitments, but it's actually quite hard to figure out what the underlying numbers are and to hold them accountable. So for example, if you take a look at the science-based target initiative, um, I think there's something like 30 countries in Africa that have signed up as in committed to it, and 12 companies that have actually established targets that they're going to be held accountable for. Yeah. So it's, um, it is a space to watch, and it's certainly an area of growing risk. Um, and I think just relating to Zanela's point earlier about um, understanding, I think that um, as as a corporate, as, as people and organizations, one of the biggest things you can do is upskill yourself and your staff and your suppliers <laughs> and to understand what these things mean so that you can interrogate the issues and ask the right questions so that when you make these commitments, they are credible and they have integrity in them. Okay, perfect, thank you. Sorry, yes. Sorry I, think, um, I think the question towards Amy is, the relevance of net zero in the African continent. So I think we know in terms of the overall carbon emissions of Africa as a continent relative to the rest of the world, I think we're less than 5% as the entire continent. Um, however, net zero obviously being imposed on, on, the, on the continent, do you think it's unfairly or unfair to the development of the economy in Africa that we are imposed with the same restrictions from a net zero uh, or from a carbon emissions point of view in that, number one, the Western world or the first, first world countries sort of have based their economy on a very carbon intensive uh, economy and are sort of only introducing sustainable initiatives whereas Africa was always catching up. Do you, do you feel that it's and a burden that we shouldn't really walk down at the moment, or do you, are we, is it part and parcel of the journey? Yeah, I mean, it's such a, um, it's a tough question, but I think what I would say to that is, first of all, I, I looked at the um, report from the International Energy Agency and the World Bu Green Building Council released last year. Um, Africa contributes to 10% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the issue is, of course, that we all operate in a system. So even if, um, y you know, whatever the one person does it impacts the other country, it's like being on a sinking ship and bailing out a bucket on the one side. Um, what I, it, it is true that um, Africa has, um, has, uh, has struggled, has um, been prejudiced, and um, in that respect, I mean, I think we're not seeing enough movement in terms of the funding that's been promised through the international climate negotiations from developed countries to Africa, for example. And I think that that's going to be a very big topic at this upcoming COP. But at the end of the day, from, I guess, from a more selfish perspective, the reality is that if you operate and own a real estate business, your assets are at risk from the impact of climate change now. You can see that from the floods that happened recently in Natal, for example. So you not taking action on it means that you are putting your assets at risk and you're putting your business at risk because these changes are gonna happen in terms of the regulations. It's what we call transition risks. Um, and so you need to be prepared for them. If I could do maybe a slightly more practical Thing in this current environment, and yes, it's 5% and it's this and all of that, but we face in Africa an electric 
electricity crisis, let's be honest. And you need to have an occupancy certificate for your buildings for people that you occupied for them to pay you rental for them to actually have an investment case. If we can't provide electricity in the failing infrastructure and in the failing environment, we actually don't have an asset. We don't have an investment value. And that's why, to me, while Africa might be 5% and might be this and that, we're facing slightly different challenges at, as an ability to operate the assets for their intended purpose is now at risk. And that, to me, it becomes a stranded asset in your entire portfolio. And that is really what we're trying to alleviate is the investability of our portfolios and people wanting to invest in those portfolios because they have consistent income. To me, it's a very different approach to that of Europe. They don't have the same sort of risk processes. They are high carbon users and they're looking at it in a very different way. In Africa, we're facing, do we have electricity? Do we have water? Do we have this? Do we have that? If we don't have those fundamentals in place, ladies and gentlemen, you can't occupy the building. Nobody's gonna pay rental for it. MC is about to kick us off, but Chilo. Cool, yeah. I think just on you know, the, the question around the, the rest of Africa. The rest of Africa, and I think now maybe we can include South Africa in this uh, category now, the rest of Africa largely powers itself, right? Especially outside of, of Southern Africa. The last four or five years, we've done a lot of work developing a building energy code in, in Nigeria. And what, when we talk about net zero, you know, we keep saying that it's about a high level of energy efficiency. It's not about the renewable energy side. So as we develop Africa now with these targets and all of that, it's actually a huge enabler to development because now if you've got a country like Nigeria that um, can only actually produce 20% of its actual capacity, right? They've got a massive housing deficit. And if you could bring on 100,000 homes at a quarter of the power demand, right? It actually means that you can actually uh, grow. So net zero and all these sustainability targets that we have are in no way a hindrance to development in Africa. In fact, those are the right sort of targets for us to start growing our property industry because the whole reason why there's the risk of Africa is that we're about to start growing and we have to leapfrog that, you know, 100 years of inefficient design, not designing for your environment, all of those things, and we just start there. But the incentive is more than there, you know. If you have to, you can imagine in South Africa if every single business had to operate and they were running their own electricity. Like I think if you go to a office block or a apartment building or something in Lagos and you see like a row of generators, you see the reality of having to generate your own power, then you see the real impact of reducing demand in terms of the benefit it, it will have. Thanks, Chilo. We have to stop, but I think MC, the takeaway is that reset will include net zero. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much. Please help me with a round of applause for our amazing panel. <clears throat>